You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 10, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Nicholas Carr, the Pulitzer Prize nominated author of best selling books such as The Shallows What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, The Glass Cage How Our Computers Are Changing Us, and most recently, Utopia is Creepy, which is now out in paperback. He writes frequently about technology and culture on his blog, Rough Type with a special emphasis on the ways in which technology affects the way we think. We are extremely pleased to welcome Nicholas Carr to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Hi, this is Robert Plotkin, the host of the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Today I'll be interviewing Nicholas Carr, who has written extensively about the ways in which digital media dissolve boundaries of space and time. As you'll hear in the interview, one of his suggestions for protecting ourselves against the harmful effects of overuse of smartphones and other technology is to put our phones away when we eat dinner with our families or go for a walk. This is just one way in which we can reintroduce boundaries into our interactions with technology in order to stay more present and to relieve stress and enjoy ourselves more. Here are just a few more tips for setting limits and boundaries on your use of technology. Use the Do Not Disturb feature on your phone. Turning on Do Not Disturb will silence all notifications on your phone. For example, it will stop the phone from ringing and text messages from beeping and flashing on your screen. You can either turn it on or off manually or schedule it to turn on and off at certain times. I've set mine to turn on an hour before I go to bed and turn off an hour after I wake up in order to give me a distraction-free buffer at the beginning and ending of my day. If you're worried about missing important messages, you can set Do Not Disturb to let through messages from people like your family members who you set as your VIPs. Another way to introduce boundaries, and I know that this one can be very difficult, is to keep screens out of certain rooms in your house, such as the dining room or your bedroom. If that's too hard, try doing it during certain times, such as during meals and while you're sleeping. And here's an example from our Tap into Mindfulness program. Find your smartphone right now, wherever it is, say your pocket, on your desk, or in your bag. Now reach out for it, and just before your hand reaches the phone, pause with your hand in place and ask yourself, why are you reaching for the phone, and whether you really need to pick it up right now. Then pull your hand back without picking up the phone. Practice this mindfully ten times in a row, every day. See if it helps you to avoid picking up the phone out of habit when you don't really need to. For better or for worse, today's technology doesn't impose many limits on how we use it. As a result, it's up to us to impose those limits. Stay tuned to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast and blog for more pointers on how to use technology wisely and share your insights with us. We hope you enjoyed today's tips and that you'll enjoy the upcoming interview with Nicholas Carr. Hi, Nick, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks, Robert. It's a pleasure to be your guest. Uh, thanks for being here. And I've been reading and following your work for a very long time. And although I don't think anyone would call you someone who's anti-technology, you do tend to focus on the darker or underside of technology and on challenging the assumptions and promises of people who market technology and claim that it'll bring us into some kind of utopia. You push us to ask really hard questions and to, to try to see all sides of technology. I, I have wondered what motivated you and led you in this direction to act as what I'd call a kind of techno-utopian gadfly. <laughs> um, I think originally it was my own personal experience. Um, I, in, in my own life, I, I certainly haven't been anti-technology. I've been a, a great fan of computer technology in particular. Um, when the, I was in my early 20s when the personal computer came around, and you know, I found <laughs> I found the devices absolutely fascinating and incredibly useful, and um, so so really loved uh, the technology. But it was it was 
you know, after I'd been after the World Wide Web arrived and started spending a lot of time not only using the computer but tapping into the net, um, I started noticing a troubling <laughs> change in the way I think or the, or in the way I don't think. Um, and in particular, I was having trouble concentrating, um, you know, having trouble doing things I used to do all the time, like get deeply engaged in a book, say. Um, and, and what I realized is that, that, I, that my mind seemed to always want to behave the way it behaves when I'm sitting in front of, a, when I was sitting in front of a computer screen. It wanted to be, have lots of stimulation, wanted to sh shift its focus all the time, um, get lots of information in different forms. And it, it, it kind of resisted calming down. And this was, this was really concerning to me because, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, even though I appreciated times of great stimulation, I also always appreciated times when you could be, uh, think a little more calmly and be a little more contemplative. And so I began to, to question, how our use, not only of computers and later smartphones and stuff, but how people's use of technology, of tools in general, can shape in, I think, a pretty deep way, their thoughts, their perceptions, their behavior. And that led me to, to, to see a different side of computers and the internet and, and all digital media. And it was a darker side, a, a, a kind of, a kind of reprogramming of our, of ourselves that isn't necessarily to me in our own best interest. And for those people who haven't read your 2010 book, The Shallows, when you say reprogramming of our brains, you mean that quite literally, right? Not just metaphorically. You go into the both the neuroscience in quite a lot of detail and the efforts that tech companies have made to understand our brains and to take advantage of how they work and how they can be reprogrammed. Can you talk a little bit about that for those people who aren't familiar with this literal rewiring? Sure. So our what we know about our brains, and, and this is a fairly recent development in brain science, we know that they're very adaptable. Like the rest of our bodies, we're, our minds are constantly adapting to our surroundings, to our environment. And this happens you know, not at some superficial level, but ultimately it happens at a very deep level and through a process that scientists term neuroplasticity, which we've learned a lot about in the last 40 years. And, th and that means that our brains are plastic at a biological level, plastic meaning malleable. Um, and so, and so our, our, our brains at a cellular level, at a neuronal level, are constantly adapting uh, to our surroundings, to our behavior, to our habits. Um, and that means that, for instance, um, if, you if you do a lot of thinking or perceiving in one particular way, your brain will devote more of its resources um, to that way of thinking. So it, 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 will, uh, it will kind of prune away uh, neurons and in, in, in brain circuits dedicated to other ways of thinking in order to apply those resources, those biological resources, to kind of your habitual way of thinking. Um, and this is this is <clears throat> this neuroplasticity is usually a very good thing. It, it's what makes us adaptable. It what's it what it's what gives a lot of flexibility to our thinking. So when our circumstances change, uh, we can change the, our way of thinking to to adapt to them. The problem is, is that uh, one of the, if not the most important thing <laughs> in our surroundings these days is not nature the way it used to be, but technology, which changes very, very quickly um, and I think has a particular deep effect on the way our brains function. Um, because what we know about, you know, the adaptability of our brains is that is that it is keyed to habits of thought and habits of behavior. And, you know, with a computer, with a smartphone, we really deeply change our habits. We, we use it for all sorts of things, all sorts of perceptional things, all sorts of cognitive purposes. And as a result, I think it's a very, very powerful 
means of influencing the way our minds work. Um, that can be for the good, but it also can be for the bad. There's no, there's no rule that says our adaptations, our brain's adaptations have to go in a positive direction. Uh, they, they, since they're just sheer adaptations to the environment and the things in the environment, they can go in a bad way too. I remember one of the things I was quite surprised to learn in the shallows was that uh, the idea that once you reach a certain age, your ways of thinking, let's say, are fairly fixed seems is not true. You know, you and your personal story seems to bear it out that you were well into adulthood uh, when you had developed certain patterns of thinking and being able to engage in deep thought you talked about. Uh, being able to read a book from start to finish. And in, in the book, you quote not just yourself, but other people. And these are people like professors who earn their living from engaging in long, deep, extended thought, who's all said, you know, I'm really finding I can't do this anymore. Uh, and it was quite surprising to me to learn this this plasticity, maybe not to the same extent as in children, it still applies into adulthood. That's right. And... <clears throat> And until the the kind of the ex, the experiments that showed how plastic, malleable our brains are, which which began to happen, I think, in the late '60s, and, and then picked up speed in the '70s. Until then, the the common wisdom among scientists as well as the general public was that once once a person got to be 20 years old, more or less, that that's when their their brain stopped changing. You were kind of you were locked into the circuits that you had developed uh, when you were a kid uh, or a teenager. Um, and it turns out, you know, the, the 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 more recent findings say that that's not true. Um, that that our brains at a that our brain circuitry are is always kind of adapting to what's going on around us. Um, and we're 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 not only losing neurons, as, as people used to think happened after the age of 20, but we're we're growing new ones as well and in, in, in making new connections between those neurons. Um, so it, it is true that the brain is the is most flexible when we're young. Um, that's when, you know, a lot of our habits of thought are ingrained uh, into our minds. But it's false. It's wrong to think that that process ends. It, it continues throughout our life. And what about another piece of common wisdom, namely that uh, the technology really uh, can't do anything to us. Whether we use it, how we use it is under our control. We have free will. We can decide when to pick it up and put it down, turn it on and turn it off. And to claim that uh, tech companies are doing something to rewiring our brains just d doesn't jibe with that common wisdom and sounds a bit conspiratorial at first glance. Well, there probably is some <laughs> conspiratorial uh, uh, things going on behind the scenes. But yeah, I mean, we want to believe, and you hear this all the time, and I think it's our, kind of, it's our instinct that, oh, tools or technologies are neutral. Uh, we can use them whenever we want and however we want, and they're totally in our control. And while I don't want to downplay the fact that we do have choices and we do have the ability to make decisions about the tools we use and don't use, and to some extent the way we use them, I think the idea that tools and technologies are neutral is, is completely wrong. Um, that in fact, you know, any tool is designed by people to do to do particular things to to allow us i should say to do particular things to work in particular ways to think in particular ways and so i think that that all tools but particularly what i call intellectual technologies the tools we use to think with they're designed to to support or facilitate particular ways of thinking, but by a necessary um, trade-off, they don't <laughs> support or don't encourage different ways of thinking. So when we take those tools, those technologies into our lives, when we make them part of our thought processes, uh, we also adopt the ways of thinking that they encourage. And I call this the intellectual ethic that is built in 
to the intellectual technologies, the thinking tools that we use. Um, and, and so, yes, you can say, oh, I'm not going to use this particular um, tool or whatever. But in fact, a lot of our use of, of powerful technologies isn't entirely in our own control. It they come to us through history. We're born into a world where, where that's very technologized, and you can't just say, "Oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be part of this world." Uh, at least, it's very, very hard to do that, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. But also, but also, there are social and 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 other forces that shape our use of technology. So, some people don't have smartphones. For to take one very prominent current example. But for a lot of people, I don't necessarily think that they feel that a smartphone is – that the decision of whether to own and use a smartphone is something that's entirely in their control. They, they're they expected to behave in a certain way when they're on the job or when they're in school. Uh, their social life is built around apps and, and things that are going on on the phone. So – in many ways, we're kind of pushed and sometimes forced to use prevailing technologies. And when we begin to use them, they impose on us particular ways of perceiving the world and particular ways of acting and thinking. I'm curious uh, about some examples of those particular ways. I mean, one that jumped out at me in, in the shallows was something you called the hunting way of reading, uh, going to, let's say, a web page reading a little bit, bouncing to another link, searching somewhere else, maybe hunting and pecking from place to place. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about that and, and any other specific ways of thinking that technology, let's say, pushes or nudges us towards that are different from older ways and the consequences of that. Well, the to start with reading, um, very important way, obviously, that we that ever since the invention of uh, uh, written language, alphabets and stuff, very important way that we make sense of the world and the way we communicate our thoughts and take in the thoughts of others. Um, we've always, I think it's fair to say, read things in many different ways. So uh, you, get, you can get, you can involve yourself in what, what people, what psychologists call deep reading, which is when you're really involved in a long book or a long article, and you kind of tune out everything else and just focus on the story or the argument and get very wrapped up in it. Um, and then there's there's the way we read, say, highway signs when we're mm -hmm. driving. And, you know, you glance at them, you, you get the message very quickly. They're designed to give you the message very quickly, and that's very useful. Um, and then there are all sorts of other ways, uh, skimming and scanning, um, that you, you're you kind of hunting for information, written information that might be of interest to you. So you, you skim and you scan, and then when you say, wow, this is something I really need to pay attention to, then you involve yourself in deep reading. So there are, there are all these ways of, of reading, and they're all very, very important. I don't think any of them is bad. Um, but what's I think what, what changes, and there's quite a bit of evidence um, – to this effect, what changes when we read on screen, particularly when we're reading um, uh, web pages or social media pages, things that have lots of links, things where there's lots of different stuff going on um, in the entire technology, the entire you know web uh, net. The, the screen is giving us lots of different options for what we might look at. So there's a, there might be a page of text, but there's also your Facebook feed and your email and a zillion other things going on. Those, those – the way the technology is designed and the way we use it kind of pushes us away from – the calmness and contemplativeness that is the essence of deep reading and pushes us into a constant skimming and scanning type of behavior. So it's not that skimming and scanning is bad. It's that when that's the primary or dominant or only way we read, that becomes bad because we never uh, or very rarely are able to engage in deep reading, which is the which is the most intellectually enriching, I would argue, way of reading because you, you really you really 
deeply think about <laughs> the words that you're reading. You kind of create in your mind uh, a kind of a narrative in a, in a sense of the story. If it's fiction, for instance, you, you wrestle very deeply with complex arguments um, because you're focusing your mind. If we lose that, and I think, I, I think we do lose it as we become adapted to the way of reading that the internet uh, suggests we should engage in all the time, then we lose something very important, I think. And by extension, I, you know, I think that's one example, but by extension, I think that digital media, um, and this was when I wrote about this 10 years ago, it was, I, I could already see it in myself and in others. And since then, we've had the smartphone become the dominant uh, personal computing technology which seems to me to magnify all the things I talk about. But what this technology, the kind of thinking this technology encourages is a very fast paced, very distracted uh, way of thinking where you're multitasking, your tension's divided, you're getting lots of stimulation from lots of different store sources. It's very, it can be a very kind of bedazzling or beguiling <laughs> way of thinking, um, which is why we were so quick to engage in it. But what the technology doesn't encourage, and I think what becomes harder and harder, and I certainly see this in myself, is screening out all that stimulation, screening out all those distractions, turning off the gadgetry, and actually being, whether it's reading or, or just following your own trade of thought, being contemplative, being reflective, being introspective. The ways of thinking that, until recently at least, were considered, and I think rightly so, the highest forms of thinking that the human mind was capable of, those are the ways of thinking that the technology is making it much more difficult to engage in. They've never been easy to engage in because we're distractible people by nature, but now they're even harder to 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 indulge in. And I'm wondering what you think the serious consequences are of this. It seems like you've touched on potentially for intelligence or creativity. In fact, your article that I believe led to the writing of the shallows was called is Google making us stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in 2008. Right. Um, and that, that did lead uh, to the book. Um, well, I think, I think, I think we're losing some practical <laughs> talents and I think we're seeing the consequences now. I, I mean, for instance, I do think that, that if you're distracted and interrupted all all the time, if your if your attention is divided, it becomes much harder to to think in contextual and critical ways, which requires which requires a certain distance from information and from experience and the able in the ability to process information and experience through a deep set a deep interwoven set of knowledge in your own mind, which is kind of where we get the context to fit new bits of information into. I, I think we sacrifice that. And so I think, you know, if you look around about, about the, at, for instance, the controversies about fake news or about the polarization of political or social viewpoints, you know, I, I think there's lots of causes for that, mm -hmm. those type of problems. But I think one of them is that we're not – we're not giving ourselves time to think in those deep ways, uh, to build personal knowledge, to be skeptical, to be critical, even about views that seem to be in line with our own pre, uh, pre-existing beliefs. Um, so I think there are, you know, very practical, very immediate problems that come out of, uh, of this, these changes in the way we think. And then, and then I do think in general, it does dampen um, some, you know, our ability to, to uh, take the big picture um, and and work our work our way through very complex material, complex information, develop our own point of view. Some kinds of creativity, I think, do do only emerge from the calm, contemplative mind. You know, at the same time, to to to, to be to be balanced, there are other forms of creativity that I think are probably spurred by being able to exchange lots of information quickly and bounce ideas off other people quickly. So so there are certainly benefits as, as well as downsides. But then I think 
there's also a philosophical <laughs> philosophical loss. I think it I think it I think the ability to have time during the day regularly when you're alone with your own thoughts, when you're not distracted, when you're not interrupted, when you're not responding to the latest message, I think that that makes us more interesting people. It, it it deepens our personality, gives us more of a singular or unique personality, allows us to develop our own way of thinking and looking at the world. So even though, you know, I would be hard pressed to, uh, to put, you know, hard numbers behind what's good about that. I do think if you, if you value those kind of very subtle traits uh, of the human mind and the human personality, things that, that often get overlooked these days when we're, when we're so anxious to be useful. (laughs) Um, I think that you see, you see a big sacrifice, a big loss in those kind of metaphysical areas as well. It, it reminds me of another major theme in your work, which is the uh, offloading, let's say, of knowledge, at least information and interconnections from the human brain to the internet. And, you know, back in the 90s, maybe even later than that, and still to a lesser extent today, there's a lot of people cheerleading this idea that having this really vast set of interconnections in the web was going to make us all more intelligent and more happy in every way. And and you make the claim that this has come at the expense to some extent of the deep intercon- interconnections you talk about within the individual human mind. We're very quick, I I think, to to confuse <laughs> to confuse the web and online databases with our own brains. And I think there I, I think again there's some some deep underlying instinct that helps explain that. I, I think, you know, there are, there's this theory these days, and it's a very compelling theory to me, of what's called the extended mind or the or extended cognition, which says that we've always been very good at incorporating objects in the environment into our thought processes, that our that our thinking isn't locked inside our heads, but we're always, you know, uh, offloading memory and and even offloading kind of cognitive reasoning uh, processes onto tools and other things in the environment and and generally that's good because it kind of helps expand our ability to to think um, and perceive. But the danger is that when you have a powerful, very powerful tool always at the ready. Uh, always at your side, always on, you can start offloading very, very important mental functions onto that uh, device. Um, And you begin to lose uh, certain things that your brain is actually good at doing, whereas the technology isn't very good at doing. So I think we we see this, we see this, this, is sad to me in a way. We see this assumption that, oh, I don't have to remember things anymore because it's all out there on the on the net or on Facebook or whatever, and I can tap into it in two seconds with my phone or my computer. Um, and what that fails to recognize is that our own biological memory works in a very, very different way than <laughs> online memory works. And the most important thing about our own memory isn't that it's a whole group of individual discrete facts that are just superficially linked uh, in our brains, the way the way data exists in, in digital databases. What's, what's crucial about the process of remembering is that when we create our own memories, we create rich associations, rich connections with everything else we know. Um, so new facts that we learn or new experiences that we have are woven together with this rich body of knowledge within, inside us that, 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 that encompasses facts and experiences and emotions and perceptions. And it's those connections 
I would argue that that are the most important to our minds and to our thoughts and certainly to our to our construction of personal knowledge. So if we if we simply offload the function of memory to uh, the web to the net, and I think we are doing this, and I think there are, there have been there have been um, very interesting experiments and studies that show that we're doing this. We don't make those connections. Um, so as a result, we get we get an abundance of facts, or some some of which aren't so f- as factual as we might think, an abundance of information, but we lose the ability to to pass that new information through a rich context that exists from the interwoven uh, information in our own mind. And so, so we, we have lots of information, but we start to think more superficially about it. Um, and it seems to me that that is the big, one of the big dangers we face as we, uh, as we do offload lots of these, these mental functions onto this very fast and very capacious technology. I know in your book, The Glass Cage, which is about automation, you you do talk about some promise for ways in which technology can be developed and used to help reinforce these kinds of interconnections, even though most of the technology that we are all dealing with every day doesn't do that. Uh, you, you do point out some examples of a more positive direction. I'm thinking of uh, the examples you gave of architects who have actually swung back, you could say, from using highly automated drafting software to software that's more interactive. And the same with uh, photographers who have s- switched back from digital to analog to use a process in which they are interacting back and forth more with the technology and using more of their own brain to do the the hard labor and not offloading it. I wonder if you can talk, I mean, we've been focusing mostly on the critical, uh, but I'm wondering if you could talk about what you see as some of the promise for using technology and, and not just uh, throwing it all away. You know, it's not that, computer technology, digital technology is bad. It's it's extraordinarily powerful and can be extraordinarily useful in in many, many ways, as we as we all know and as certainly certainly I know. The the problem is that it's so powerful <laughs> um, in becoming ever more so in 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 so good at anticipating our needs and then fulfilling them without us having to make much effort. And this is of course isn't isn't something that comes mysteriously out of the technology. It's it's something that's the technology is designed and programmed to do because it suits the business interests of the of of the companies who make this stuff who want us to be dependent on it. And I don't, I don't necessarily mean they they want that in an evil way. They they love the technology too, uh, but their business profits are are very much caught up in making us as dependent on computers and smartphones and stuff as possible. So we use them more and more, and they they make more money. So that's just that's kind of obvious. But so it's not so the the hard thing. Is to figure out how, how should I use this tech, this powerful technology that can actually do pretty much anything for me? How do I set limits on it? How do I decide what am I going to, to let the technology do? What am I going to do in concert with the technology? And what am I going to do just by myself? Um, and and I do think that one of the themes that came out through my research is that is that very smart, very creative, very intelligent people are beginning to be more skeptical about these powerful tools. So for, in, for instance, architects, um, it's gotten to the point where there is architectural software that you can sit down, an architect can sit down, plug in some numbers, some parameters, and the software will do most, most of the work in designing um, the building or the public space or whatever. And as as happens to all of us, I think the the initial reaction, even of very experienced architects, is to say, "Oh, this is cool! Look what I can do with this machine! Look th- what this machine can do for me!" And so, as I, you know, as I found out when I interviewed different architects, the first instinct is, "Let's just make use of all of this stuff. Let's sit down when we have a new project. Let's sit down immediately at the computer and start plugging in 
data and, and see what the computer says. And I think this, what, what, smart architects and sensitive architects are beginning to realize is that, you know, in the early stages of a pro project, actually, depending too much on the computer can lock us into a narrow way of thinking. Um, the computer isn't all that good. At, it doesn't have the ability of an experienced, talented human mind to conceptualize in a very, very wide open space. And so, so what they're doing is they're going back in many cases to things like sketching by hand on a pad of paper or building models out of uh, cardboard and foam core and stuff. Um, and then th it's only later in the process when you want to, for instance, kind of design complex systems for, you know, heating or something where where it where the power of the computer can be very very beneficial because it speeds up a kind of uh, these kind of decisions and it also can you know allow you to 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 kind of print out you know uh, uh, plans and so forth in a much more in a much faster and much more kind of uh, much more multifaceted way than than people are are capable of so it's so what they're doing is they're saying, you know, there are some stages in work, creative work or analytical work where computers are very powerful and, and we want to bring those in. But then there are other areas and they tend to be more formative areas where if you bring in a computer too early, early it shuts down your creative abilities. And it also, and we see this in other areas, it also can dull your talents because you become so dependent on it. And so we want to clear that space for us to work uh, with our own minds, with our with our colleagues, without the mediation of computers. Another another example that I think shows how even small des design decisions and use decisions can have a powerful impact is in the area of radiology and medicine. Um, now that you know X rays and other medical images are digital, um, it becomes very easy to run those images through a computer th and, and uh, through an algorithm that can interpret the image. And so, and so that's what happens in, in many cases now. Before a radiologist, uh, an experienced doctor, looks at an image, it will be processed by uh, a piece of software that highlights particular places on the image that look suspicious based on you know the data that the that the computer has on the one hand that can be very beneficial because it can focus a human being's eyes on areas in the image that they might not have looked at closely enough and so they might detect a disease thanks to the highlighting from the computer but what studies have shown is that that this process can also have the opposite effect, where we tend to trust computers so much that the professional's eyes are very much focused, end up very much focused on the areas that the software highlights, and they don't look as closely at other areas, and as a result can miss uh, potential diseases that they would have otherwise seen. And so what what some uh, doctors and, and some hospitals are realizing that is that if we change this process so that before the image goes through the software, we give the raw image to the talented, experienced radiologist and let him or her look at it and analyze it first, then they might, you know, we might get the best of their uh, experienced eye and then subsequently run it through the software and then they can, the, the, the professional can use the highlights of the software to kind of double check their own work. Um, and, the, and you kind of get the best of both worlds, the, 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 the deep knowledge of the human being and also the power of the computer just by shifting uh, the way you use the machine a little bit. And I think it's these kind of decisions about designing software, designing uh, computer gadgets, designing the processes by which we use them, that we can come to a more fruitful collaboration and partnership with our machines. But this requires a change in the uh, 
in the dominant way of thinking about computer design and computer use, which more and more says, let's figure out what a computer can do and then use it for whatever it can, mm-hmm. we can possibly make it do. And then whatever's left over, we'll, we'll allow ourselves to do that. That's the wrong approach, it strikes me. Yeah, the computer mac- automation maximalism. I mean, right. It, uh, it, it also, I think you also talked about uh, there, there are side benefits, so to speak, to this, which is it's not just that um, making the best use of the human and the computer in an individual case gives you a better outcome, but that over time, as you said, the person is getting to exercise their skills and keep them fresh and perhaps even improve uh, so that over time they can they can get better. I would guess uh, also be happier, more satisfied at their job. And I know you pointed out in the book ways in which it means that people are then better, much better prepared either for an emergency, an unusual situation, or a situation in which the technology fails because they've been keeping their skills up all along. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a fundamental concept in the, in the science of automation, the science of how humans and machines interact, and particularly humans and computers – that that's called the automation paradox. Um, and I, I wish this was more broadly known, particularly by software designers and system designers. But what the automation paradox says is that we often bring in computers into a complex process with the hope of reducing human error. So we think that, you know, the more that we can we can use the power of a computer to do things then the less likely we are to suffer occasional human errors which can be very <laughs> which can be very bad in in the worst cases but what happens is that that you bring in a computer into a complex process the human being begins to rely more and more on the computer to do the hard work analysis uh, perception decision making judgment making and as a result, the human being is not engaged in the hardest elements of the work. The human being is not challenged. And what we know about the way we learn things and the, the way we develop talent is that it's all about being challenged. It's all about facing hard problems and figuring out how to solve them. And that's how we build up our knowledge. And and then once we've solved one hard problem, we can solve another even harder problem. Um, and when you bring in a computer to ease our way through our jobs, we don't face those cha- challenges. We begin to lose our skills. Uh, we begin to lose our engagement in the work, in our situational awareness. And then what happens is if, the, if something goes wrong, something that the computer can't handle, or if there's a technological problem uh, where the computer <laughs> shuts down or something, suddenly you have a human being who is less capable, less talented, less engaged in the work, and much more likely – to make an error. So we the paradox is we bring in the technology to reduce human error and we end up making human error both more probable and in some cases, the worst cases, more catastrophic when it happens. Um, so this is, you know, this is something that that is very tricky to deal with um, because I, I think in many ways the incentives and motivations, which are not as I say, are not evil or bad motivations of the system designers and the software writers are in tension, fundamental tension with what is actually the best way to develop very skilled, very insightful human beings, which we still need. In fact, I would argue in some cases we need them more than ever. And also, uh, you know, as you mentioned, the fact is that not only are our talents um, dependent on being challenged and doing hard work, but much of the satisfaction and fulfillment that comes to us from our jobs or even from the things we do in our personal lives comes from facing difficult problems and challenges and overcoming them. That's a that's a very important source of satisfaction. That in our in our in our rush to feel 
feel it's in our rush to gain convenience and ease and easiness we often overlook uh, but when once you steal those sources of satisfaction um, in engagement and fulfillment from us um, then we're left kind of alienated and in, in feeling kind of underutilized to use a labor term um, and I think I think a lot of us, and I think if if you look at some of the kind of psychological problems that seem to be prevalent in society, I think these reflect the fact that we are becoming too dependent on technology to do hard things for us, and as a result, we end up disaffected. Yeah, and as I was reviewing your work in preparation for this, uh, another theme which this reminds me of, I think, in, in a lot of your work has been uh, to what extent... Uh, does making computers more intelligent not just potentially make result in us being less intelligent, but is there some way in which making machines more human uh, result in us being more machine-like? And is that inevitable, or is there some other way we can design and use machines? I think it is. I, I think it is something... I don't, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think if we... If we use, if we become dependent on technology without very carefully thinking about what both what's gained and, and what might be lost, then I think it's very easy to have this kind of transfer of sensibility um, between the technology and the human being. So we, we the more quote unquote, lifelike, we made the technology or the more able to take over um, responsibility for things we might have done ourselves, the more we begin to look at the world and to act in the world the way a computer would, because we're so dependent on it. Um, in that, in the case of computer technology, which is all, which has, as well as being a kind of tool, has also become the dominant form of media technology. I think it ha it magnifies that effect because we find ourselves mediated, mediating our relationship with the physical world, the social world, other people, our own experiences. More and more, we either we either have those experiences through a computer screen, or we have a computer screen nearby <laughs> that is influencing the, even the direct experiences we have uh, with the physical world, with nature, with society. Um, and so, I think I, I I think for both of those reasons, you know, one we're we're offloading some responsibilities to computers, and also we're allowing computers to mediate. Our experience for both of those reasons, we tend, we will tend, if we don't resist some aspects of that, we will tend to, to see the world and act in the world more like computers do. I wonder if you have any suggestions. Uh, we've talked a bit about ways in which technology could potentially be redesigned. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for those many people out there who aren't in a position to redesign technology, but who are users of it, people like you and me. What, what, what have you done or what suggestions do you have for people who you know, have no choice in a lot of ways but to use existing technology, but to do so in a way that enhances their humanity and intelligence and avoids as much as possible a lot of these negative effects you point out? I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say we have no choice because we have choices in what devices we buy and use, what what software we buy and use, what apps we download or don't download. And ultimately, you know, the design the design questions or the or the people who are doing the designing are influenced by their customers because that's what their business involves. So if their customers demand different kinds of products and different kinds of experiences and different kinds of interfaces, then I think the companies will have no choice to respond. In fact, they'll respond quite quite readily. You know, the the tricky thing there is that doing making those choices individually doesn't really have much of an effect. So so 
more it, it only has effect if a lot of people <laughs> try to put pressure a lot of people become aware of these issues and try to put pressure through their actual purchases and use patterns and behavior put pressure on the suppliers and and I, you know i think that's hard but i don't think it's impossible but but as for individuals you know i don't think i don't think there's any mystery here it, it's all about in and, and, and this isn't easy because in many ways it requires changing changing your habits which is always hard and it also in some cases means going against the general flow of society um but it it means being more deliberate in your choices about how and when you use different technologies we we kind of I think a lot of people have come to assume for this is one example that they have to have their that they have to carry their smartphone with them all the time. One thing we know about the smartphone is when it's near us even when we're not actively looking at it 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 influences our thoughts. It's a very very powerful um attractant for our minds uh and and certainly a very powerful pull on our attention and because our we have you know our brains have limited amounts of attention to allocate to the world and limits of limited amounts of cognitive resources every time you know every time that the phone pulls on us it 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 reduces our ability to pay attention to other things and to think deeply and so forth so you know one thing i would encourage is is simply for people to say you know I'm going to go out shopping or I'm going to go out for a walk or I'm going to have dinner with my family and you know I'm going to turn off my smartphone and I'm going to put it in a different room. <laughs> I'm going to get it far away from me. And you know that's actually not that hard to do. Um it's hard to do when you first do it because you're we're so we're so used to having it around all the time and pulling it out and looking at it and feeling a buzz and stuff that you feel like something is missing. But I think I think what you find is if you spend a significant amount of time during the day without your without your iPhone or your Android or whatever at hand it really will change your sense of freedom of thought uh your sense in your perspective and stuff and I think that is something that's actually possible but people don't pe- people are so people are so habituated to keeping the phone with them and and feeling that it's somehow essential to their life that they don't even think about the fact that it doesn't have to be that way so so i think so i think it is possible for us to be more deliberate in making choices about when and how we use all these devices and all this software um but it does it it does require backing up a bit in saying that the kind of the general patterns that seem to be the norm in society may not be the best patterns for how how we interact with this the, these very powerful technologies yeah setting limits on how when where and practicing remembering to do them and 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 doing them and it's more than saying well we're going to have a digital sabbath on sunday or something and which i'm not saying is bad but it but <laughs> that's that's an example to me of the technology still determining your behavior um and people don't tend to sustain those types of things when they're just kind of these isolated moments and all, and it also means that you're saying to yourself that the other 6 days my mind can be totally wrapped up in the technology <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily solve the problem hmm. i wonder um somewhat related uh, your latest book, which I love the title, Utopia is Creepy, uh, which is going to be coming out in paperback soon, is a collection of essays, many of them blog postings. I've read your blog for a long time. The postings on them do tend to be much more contemplative and deliberative than on many other blogs, and and yet it is a blog. For you, it seems like an interesting choice to write a blog at all and to publish a book of blog postings. I'm just curious about your own experience doing all of this, your thought process as a writer and who some as someone who writes about digital media. 
you know, what what is your experience that you could share about the process of of blogging, particularly given how many years you've been doing it and how it relates to the actual content of your work? Yeah, I, I don't even want to think about how many years. I've been doing it, but <laughs> but I started I started my blog in two thousand and five. Um, ancient history now. <laughs> ancient history. Also, although the beginnings of contemporary history, because that's when you know just we were just on the it was called Web two point back then, and just on the verge of the kind of revolution in social media and smartphone like devices. They were Blackberries then, but the iPhone <laughs> was coming up pretty soon, um, and. You know, I, I started kind of just as an experiment because there was all sorts of blogging going on and I was a you know, I was a technology writer. And so I said, you know, what what is this thing? And the best way <laughs> to learn about what the thing is is to actually do it for a while. So I didn't I didn't really expect that I would end up, you know, continuing it for twelve years or how, how, however long it's been. But but I did find that I that it it allowed me to do a different kind of of writing that was actually quite fun and, and and quite interesting, and I think the original conception of the blo- of blogs, which come from the term weblog, was that people would read things online or see things online, and then they'd write their reactions to them and they'd post them on their blog. Um, and to me, that was very interesting because I I think it was different from any writing form we've had before. It was kind of, you took the form of a diary where you're kind of keeping track of your personal experiences and your reaction to them, but you're doing it in public. So there's a formal aspect to it. You're not just writing for yourself, you're writing for an audience, but you're writing kind of a very real time, very immediate reaction to other people's writings, to videos, to whatever you're you're finding online, and and that struck me as a very interesting <laughs> experiment, and also an interesting kind of challenge. Um, and so it, it, I got caught up in it. Um, and even though, you know, now I I blog much less frequently than I did back then when I was posting two or three th- things a day, which is kind of hard to sustain. Um, it's still, it's still, I still like that aspect of it, that, that you very quickly, you come across something interesting and by writing about it for an audience, you clarify what that thing means to you and you kind of analyze it a little bit and place it in context. And so I think it's an interesting writing tool and I think it's an interesting thinking tool as well. Um, so you know, there have been times when I say, "Ah, oh, this is taking up <laughs> too much of my time and stuff," and I, I, I sometimes, you know, go a couple of months without blogging. And I think, "Oh, I'm just going to give it up." And then I come across something. And I say, "Well, you know, I have something to say about this, and it, it might might not warrant waiting to get it published or making the effort to do that, but I would like to get it down <laughs> because I think it's interesting to me." And so, and so, it, it's a it's a form of writing in a form of publishing that allows you to do something as a writer and as a thinker that wasn't really possible to do before. I mean, it sounds to me like your own experience and the way you're doing this is very much consistent with what you say in your books about, uh, I would say, um, engaging in a diversity or variety of ways of thinking and, and writing. It's not that the somewhat quick a uh, quick and dirty way of publishing is bad in and of itself, that it becomes a problem when it's the only way people are writing or reading. And you've continued to write books, you and even on your blog, as I said, they're somewhat infrequently published. They're certainly longer than the typical blog. Uh, it sounds to me like you found a way to integrate it and use it as a supplement to your other ways of thinking. Is that fair? I think so. And, and it also... There's also one other benefit as a writer that I get from it, and that is that that my blog itself becomes a repo- <laughs> becomes a searchable database of things that I've come across that actually were interesting. And sometimes, you know, when you're in the when you're engaged in you know browsing the web, it doesn't take long to forget about <laughs> where you found this interesting thought. So it actually 
the fact that I can go to my blog and search for stuff that that I vaguely remember coming across and actually find not only find it but find how I reacted to it is actually very has a very practical value value for me. Um, on the other hand, I've resisted uh, things like Twitter, um, Facebook, kind of the the very short form um, conversational writing that that social media encourages and, and makes possible. And it's not because I don't because I think it's some horrible thing. I mean, I mean, I think it can be fun and engaging, but I do. I I'm suspicious of something like Twitter because I think a lot of people, including very smart people, burn a lot of time and energy in argumentation that leads nowhere. And so knowing that I'm a fairly argumentative person to begin with, I kind of try to keep my distance from that because I, there's enough sources of wasted time <laughs> around. I, I don't necessarily need a new one. So you're, you're practicing what you preach when it comes to setting limits. I hope so. I, I mean, I, I struggle you know, I feel the pull of this technology as much as anyone, and so I struggle with it all the time. But I do think that, and, and this, a lot of this comes out of the research I've done that kind of exposes some of the instinctive reactions that we have that we're not, we're often not even conscious of when we come up against, you know, huge unlimited amounts of information and stimuli, and how that can very, very quickly and unconsciously kind of commandeer our minds. I, that's, that's helped me realize that, you know, we need, <laughs> we need to be skeptical here. We do need to set, set limits. We need to make sure we continue to read and think and perceive in different ways, not just in the way that our computers and our smartphones want us to, to do those things. That's great. Sounds like a, a great way to wrap up everything we've been talking about. So, Thanks so much, Nicholas Carr, for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast today. Thanks. It was my pleasure. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Nicholas Carr, author of best-selling books including Utopia is Creepy, now out in paperback. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast.